everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Stash Report from the Stash Project. Today is February 4th, 2019, and we have uh, an interesting show. Now, when I was uh, initially developing this uh, episode, as it were, uh, we only had like a few things. There are going to be a couple of kit releases this week, and then we would have the new decals from SK Decals to talk about. Um, but otherwise, it really wasn't going to be too much because... You know, the Nuremberg Toy Fair was this past weekend, and we really didn't expect too much from that in terms of, uh, you know, things to show you or things to announce necessarily. Um, however, BMAX uh, had a presence, and boy, did they ever, <laughs> as you will see in a minute. So... Uh, there are only three kit releases in this video. All of them are overseas. They wrap up the end of the uh, Japanese January kits, pretty much. Uh, and then we will go into the Nuremberg Toy Fair stuff. First up, I want to talk about the SK decals that are coming out uh, this the end of this month, the end of February. I uh, don't necessarily have a direct hand in any development in these four sets. However, uh, other than championing them and going, go, Frankie, go. Uh, we'll be picking up all four of these, obviously. But uh, if you're interested, there are going to be three AMGs and one BMW M6 uh, liveries. And these are all going to be from the uh, fairly recently run. It's run in November, so it's only a few months old. Uh, 2018 uh, Fiat. Macau GT race is the last of the uh, sort of uh, international GT races for the year. So as you see here, you're going to get uh, you're going to get Farfus's car. He's driving an M6 again. He won the race. Uh, there's actually going to be a special little uh, extra bonus in with the decals commemorating uh, commemorating the uh, fact that he won the race. So that's going to be cool. The one if you were on uh, his Facebook page, you've seen it. If you don't. Just order a set and uh, be surprised. I don't want to spoil the surprise. And the other three are going to be the AMGs that ran. Uh, they are the two Group M racing cars, the 888 and the 777, as well as uh, uh, Mortara's car, which was running the number one uh, this year. Um, all very cool stuff. Um, unlike the last time we, we did these decals, we did, like, I had anything to do with this. The last time he did these decals for the Macau cars were all of the uh, AMGs pretty much were on the same sheet and you just had to choose uh, which set of stripes and which set of sponsorships you wanted to use. The 777 and 888 cars, even though they're both Group M racing cars, are so far apart as far as their graphics go, they had to be split into separate sheets. Um, I don't see this as being a big deal. Uh, I know when we were talking about it in development, he was like, you know, I, I feel bad about not being able to put them both on the same sheet. I'm like, well, I, I mean, I know people will buy decals because, you know, they like their drivers. People will buy the uh, 888 car because they are just uh, infatuated with Mario Engel, per se. But for those of us who just want liveries of cars, have the option to build whatever car we feel like on any given day, we would we would buy two sheets of that decal sheet if it was an 8.5 by 11 you know, sheet of paper to have both liveries on it because we would need to buy two to, you know, to build both cars. If you know, you know, what we're talking about from last year's set where uh, all of the AMG cars were pretty much the AMG factory livery for the most part, um, just different, different striping colors. One was like a neon yellow, one was neon green, one was red and all the rest of that. Uh, you still had to buy four of those decal sheets in order to do all four cars because all of the associate sponsorships and tire logos and stuff like that, you know, they only there was only enough to do one car per, you know, sheet. So you ended up with a whole bunch of stripes, but nothing else to show for it. Um, so, you know, it, to me, it's not that big a deal. But those decals, like I said, should be coming at the end of the month if you're interested in expanding your GT3 offerings further. Uh, I mean, right now, pretty much the only people that are doing uh, GT3 decal decals, like water slide, uh, professionally done silk screening, uh, I mean, there's plenty of uh, homemade, uh, not so much Alps anymore, but homemade laser printer, um, decal dock, and other places like that that do good work, but it's a sheet of decals where you have to trim everything out real close or else the carrier is just for the whole thing. There aren't individually pieces like a regular decal sheet would be. Uh, that is, of course, the, you know, great part about silk screening. You get those decals that are in pieces and you don't have to trim them necessarily. The downside, of course, is they cost a little bit more. It's a little bit more development time in them and all that sort of thing. Um, 
you're going to see probably with the Ford GT liveries for the 2019 24 Hours of Daytona. Though anybody who follows racing real close knows that they were doing this retro throwback uh, liveries for the Ford GTs this year. One had a Motocraft livery, one had a Castro livery. There are several of those out already in the homemade category. But in the rush to be first, a lot of times you are incorrect. So, um... I tend to wait, unless I know for a fact I can't get those decals anywhere else. Uh, and it's a car that I really, really, really want to build. So there is that. Uh, let's talk about the kit releases for this week, because I want to get, like I said, I want to get that out of the way before we delve into the actual show. All of these kits from overseas. Uh, one Fujimi, two Aoshima. So starting at Fujimi, you have this. It is the next reissue of the Suzuki Hustler. This is, of course, the No Paint, No Glue Snap Tight kit. Um, these kits, this kit, the Alford Velsa, Velfire and the uh, the new FJ are really, really good kits when it comes down to it. Don't be scared off by the no glue, new paint if you're interested in the subject matter. I know the Hustler's not going to ring everybody's bell, and not a lot of people want a big bug-eyed K, S, cute SUV type of thing. But don't let that sort of simplify thing uh, belie you from building this. This Hustler has almost 100 parts. Yeah, it's curbside, but it's a really nice kit. It is really sort of showing you perhaps what the future of kit engineering is going to look like, uh, especially from Fujimi, obviously. The FJ Cruiser is 130 plus parts. Like, there are a lot of parts to these kits, despite being snap tight kits. Now, a lot of that has to do with all the components on the body being separate and things like that. But don't, like I said, if you're interested in the subject matter, don't let the glue paint thing scare you off. Just watch the stash project. I'll let you know which ones have real decals and which ones don't, and then you can go from there. This one, which is molded in pink, yikes. But hey, it is one of the colors. You see all of the colors you can get a Hustler in. I don't believe we're going to get releases of all of these necessarily, but this one specifically is, is molded in pink. Um, this one does not have a decal sheet. It only has the Mylar stickers. So, um, yeah, if you want one in pink to do like a no paint build, sorry, this really isn't the one for you. You're going to have to paint on pink. But unless you don't mind using the stickers. They're not that good of stickers. Um, like I said, the other, some of the other hustlers do have decal sheets. Go back and watch the other videos when they came out in the last couple of months. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which ones do, which ones don't. Oh, this one does not. So then we have uh, the Aoshima releases. Oh, don't mind that. That's just my Qualcomm telling me that I am on a restricted truck route, I, even though I'm clearly parked. <laughs> God bless the GPS in this system, but uh, I forgot to turn the volume off on that. So every, every hour it cycles through to catch messages from our corporate operations and things like that. That way it's not constantly on and draining the battery of the truck, but that's what that chirpy noise was. Anyway, uh, Aosha McKenzie got a one reissue. Well, there's both reissues. One's a straight reissue. One's a reissue to the new uh, boxing line. First up is this. It is the uh, More Grand Champions. Uh, got the page on the wrong page here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The Japanese four doors what they call this one this is of course a 1980s uh nissan skyline um post gtr years you know what you're sort of getting with these things they're customized uh you know kids i guess let's say you know much about it this one doesn't have a whole bunch of gaudiness compared to some of the other ones uh it's like a new grill new headlights um it's got some ground effects and different you know obviously the smaller sets of wheels that the grand champion series runs a sort of non-integrated, almost a Z70, Z28 style uh, rear spoiler to it, but it's not like, whoa, over fenders, like some of these ones are. So a little bit milder uh, version, but it's still, uh, you know, it's an old kit and everything else that goes with that. The other release from Aoshima this month is this. It is the Nissan uh, Pajero Metal Top Wide, the uh, two-door, as, as it were. Um, the Pajeros, as we talked about before, come in like three sizes. There's the Pajero uh, junior, which is a case uh, size two door, the Pajero itself, which is a regular sort of full size uh, ladder frame truck, you know, SUV truck SUV back in the day, uh, that is a two door, and then there is the Montero Pajero, which is a four door, which is what we got here in the United States, obviously, is Mitsubishi Montero. So this kit uh, has been around for a while. Uh, it got reissued not too terribly long ago, so I didn't pick this one up because I've got the last issue. Um, 
yeah, I'm trying to think what year this is supposed to represent, 1991, and uh, it has a lot of the optional parts in it from all of the other releases of the Pajero over the t over the course of time. So there's a couple sets of wheels here. There's uh, a roof rack. There's roof lights. There's a grill. A couple of different uh, like roll, uh, not grill, rolls, but uh, bull guards, if you will. There are a couple of different uh, front. Um, brush guards with lighting options. There's like a ladder rack for the back. So you have a, a bunch of extra parts in this that I think make the kit worth a little more in the value sense um, if you're interested in something like that. So that, guys, like I said, is going to wrap up our kit releases for this video. Now, if you don't care about race cars at all, you can go ahead and have a nice day and we'll see you guys on the other side. If you are into race cars, we'll we have the episode for you. So we're going to talk about uh, the kits that were sh announced, I guess we would say, in some cases, shown in others uh, from the uh, Nuremberg Toy Fair. Now, Heller was there in some aspect of being in like a hobby shop's display. Heller did not have a booth this year. They're continuing to flounder around aimlessly, I guess, at this point. So... Estafette Van, probably never. I don't know. It just, just seems like they can't... Every time they seem to have their act together, they immediately lose their act <laughs> within a couple weeks. If they were a Broadway production show, they would be opening things on very small off-Broadway theaters that would close the weekend they open. So there's nothing to talk about there. Airfix didn't have any cars, at least not that I saw. Um, we've already talked about the Ravel of Germany stuff, uh, or the Ravel stuff at this point. Um, they did have a one-to-one -one scale Dutz tractor there, which is their new farm tractor kit that they're going to come out with this year. So that was kind of interesting. But the the actual like kit itself, the new Land Rover Series 3 and the AAR Cuda were all shown as box art, but there wasn't any parts. There were no tooling. It was just, I mean, it was a huge booth. It's probably the largest booth that Ravel has run since I've been following very closely and doing the show for the last four years. But it's that you know there wasn't anything to show for it per se. Hey, look some box art, fantastic, great. What about the kit itself? <laughs> Nothing. So that left us with like a Ocean had a booth, uh, Belkits had a booth. Um, I had pictures and now I don't know where they went because I'm sitting here looking at the screen of the uh, Belkits. Uh, Ford Fiesta, the 2017 World Rally Car, which I don't believe I have anymore because I don't see them on my phone because I'm driven, like downloading pictures off the internet on my phone, transferring one on my computer to record the video and then transferring them back onto my phone to upload it. But uh, be that as it may, they showed off the new kit the the uh, because the World Rally Car, the 2017 World Rally Car, the Red Bull sponsored car, the car that won the championship in 2017, that kit is available right now, I believe, only through Domino, which is their uh, Bell Kits retail arm in Belgium. Uh, they're running like 55, almost $56 or 56 pounds. I think it comes out to close to $60. Uh, I expect Spot Model will probably get it next because they're in Spain, so European shipping. Uh, I'm sure that M&S Hobbies will carry it at some point in the future when the you know the supply gets to the United States. Right now, none of the uh, Japanese companies or Japanese websites have it for pre-order because, of course, that kit will be distributed through Aoshima, like all the rest of the bulk kits. Uh, kits have been in the past, but you're probably looking at like six months down the road for that to happen. At least with the Opal Mantas, there was a nearly six month delay between the time that the kits were uh, on the market in Europe and the time that Japan actually received them to distribute them through uh, Aoshima. So if you really, really, really want one up front, Domino is the way to go because they're the only ones that have it. The rest of Europe should have it soon. Expect this to be another fifty to sixty dollar kit, uh, the way bulk kits have been. There's not really much you can do about it, other than just wait for a while because eventually the price goes down. Uh, looking at Domino's website here um, a couple days ago, the price on that Fiesta is, like I said, fifty six pounds or fifty six euros, excuse me. And then if you look at the Opal Mantos, which have been around for a year now, those are now selling for under 45 euros, <coughs> excuse me, which would be cheaper than anywhere else you can get them at this point, uh, shipping from Belgium uh, notwithstanding. But that's a good five to seven euros cheaper than spot model. Um, it would probably wind up being about what it costs from M&S because 45 euros is close to $50 with a really crappy exchange rate with the euro. Um, 
But, you know, it, like I said, if you want one, they're available. There is going to be a second Fiesta kit. Uh, they did not show it. They showed the box art, but they actually had the parts and the decals and everything uh, available on the thing. It's nothing you guys haven't seen before because we've shown that stuff to you, but I don't want to not... I don't want to neglect and pretend like they weren't there. So they were there. Uh, Aosh met a booth, taught me I had a booth. And then the surprise, because I didn't really look for it in the listings of the vendors, was BMAX was there. So let's talk about Aoshima real quick, because they had a little teaser at their booth, which uh, announced, in effect, a new uh, kit. Hasegawa was there as well. Don't want to discount them, but nothing was there that we don't know about. Uh, they were basically showing existing kits. Like, they had the parts runners and to the RC-91 and, uh, and things like that. But, of course, that kit's already come out a couple months ago. So they were more like, hey, here's the things we have available, European vendors. Why don't you purchase them for us? So this, like I said, is from Aoshima, uh, showing their newest addition to the Aoshima Supercar Series scheduled in 2019. So for people who can't figure out what this is just by glancing at it, I mean, there are only two options when it comes to Pagani's. You either get a Warrior or you get a Zonda. So this is going to be the Pagani Zonda. It is the car that uh, launched Pagani for all pr practical purposes as a car manufacturer. Um, they were made from 1999 until 2017. A lot of people don't realize that the Pagani, it's the Warrior itself, they only were only supposed to make a hundred of them because that was the engine agreement with Mercedes-Benz and AMG for the engine. Uh, and they were all sold out in 2015 before the cars were even made. So the Pagani itself right now doesn't make a car because the war has ended production at the end of 2018. So right now Pagani doesn't have a car to make. Uh, be interested to see what they do in the future. Um, they certainly made some very, very unique cars over the years. But, yeah, I don't know when in 2019 we're going to get a Zonda. I mean, I suppose we'll tune in uh, with eager anticipation to the Shizuka Hobby Show in May to see if they uh, have anything else other than a silhouetted highlight in terms of kits. So I don't know if this is, you know, a summer kit in the sense that it will come out July, August, September after Shizuka, or we're talking about this being like an all Japan toy and hobby show announcement in October that'll come out towards the very, very end of this year. Um, but you know, for people who like Pagani's and really want to know why they never made a Zonda to begin with, well, the answer is they are going to make a Zonda. I'm not really sure what needs to be done with the car in terms of how much parts sharing can go with it, because I'm pretty sure the engine is pretty similar. Maybe it needs a new top end, but I'm pretty sure the block itself could pass uh, between the two in terms of, you know, they're both the same engine block, basically. So that's coming out, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, you can see some of the other debris in the background for their booth, They're just showing kits that are, of course, already released. Uh, Tommy had their booth, and, of course, one of the things they had sh uh, right up front for everybody was the TSO50. Now, if you're not into racing, the TSO50 is the prototype series car that won, outright won, the 2018 24 Hours of Le Mans. Also ran the rest of the World Endurance Championship, um, which technically the season for the World Endurance Championship runs summer to summer one year and then beginning of year to end of year and the next year there's some weirdness with that i'm not exactly sure how how exactly anybody thought that was a good idea but they've got to go through the uh come back to, to the six hours of spa frank and short frank and champs uh before they get to end the actual 2018 world endurance uh championship series so here's a picture of the built kit with the decals showing off in the background there uh, some people have complained that there are no actual Le Mans wording on these. Um, I don't know what to tell you on that necessarily, other than the fact that if these decals are the final product, like they're done and this is what you're going to get, I guarantee you within like a month, if less, somebody will come out with a, uh, you know, a little sheet of decals with the logos for the 24 hours of Le Mans. They may not have wanted to pay for the licensing for that, perhaps the licensing between, uh, you know, the actual Toyota product itself, and they've got Michelin, uh, you know, decals for the tires and things like that. Maybe that was a little bit too much and they didn't want to pay for the rest of it. I, I couldn't tell you. It looks like the only carbon fiber you're going to get with this is the carbon fiber that surrounds the headlights. Um, so that's kind of cool, but car needs more carbon fiber. I expect Speedo 27 will come through there. They tend to do that with uh, Tommy A kits in general. <clears throat> Looks like he'll be able to build this either as a seven car or the eight car, so he's got the red trim or the blue trim. Uh, and yeah, it looks like there's like 
Michelin logos for the tires that are on water slides, and then they've got those weird wet-on-wet -wet dry transfer decals that they do. I don't understand what the point of those are. I can't not stand those decals for the life of me, but Tommy insists on it. There's a huge amount of masks involved in this kit for all the little bits and pieces. I'm sure that it makes more sense once you've actually seen the instructions, but there's that. And then we have the parts layout itself. Yeah which uh, shows you that this car, this kit does not come with an engine. It's going to have basically about four pieces to the engine. Uh, there is a very, very basic looking engine block that comes off the rear bulkhead. There is the, en the transaxle piece that's going to make up the rear suspension because that'll be shown, uh, you know, through the back of the car, basically. Uh, and then there is a sort of an engine cover piece that, that also puts up the top of the uh suspension top of the rear suspension i know a lot of people would be disappointed with that and i know the rear cowling is a separate piece on this but i don't believe this car is really truly designed to be displayed with the rear cowling off you know it's not really that type of kit um it looks like the front well, the whole front end of this uh, kit is multi-piece which should be very very interesting to put together also may make masking uh easier in terms of doing the paint uh, scheme but you know it's a uh, it's pretty much what you would expect out of a Tommy kit at this juncture. Um, you, know, you could complain about the lack of the full detail engine, and perhaps it's not as detailed as some of those 1990s Group C cars and the earlier uh, Le Mans stuff like the 767 and the Jag and the uh, Nissan. And I'm trying to think there's one more in there that I'm completely forgetting right now. The Sobers. Um, but this is sort of modern day Tommy. I like take it or leave it. Um, I plan to take it. And, uh, you know, it'll do what it needs to do. It'll sit, look, it'll sit on the shelf and look good. Um, I, 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 I totally get the idea behind complaining that it doesn't have an engine because I've seen that already. But at the same time, you have to understand that if they release this kit sometime in the, like, the fall, maybe the winter, maybe they could have done something with that because... The, the rules and prototype in, in WEC are changing to the point where I don't believe the TSO 50 is going to be able to run in the 2019 season that starts after the middle of the spring of this year. Uh, but currently, the car is still you know, in a series. So they probably were not willing to show Tombia, hey, here's what our engine looks like. Um, so, you know, it is what it is in that sense. Uh, I, so I'm sure that aftermarket decal suppliers will take care of uh, giving you the WEC liveries as far as the World Endurance car specifically, as well as the 24 Hours of Mons. I would not be too terribly worried about that unless I'm sure Studio 27 will eventually do a carbon fiber set for it because they just they do that with race cars, and I thank them for it. Hmm, excuse me. And so let's go over to the BMAX booth. BMAX didn't really have a whole lot of stuff there in the sense of like, oh, look at all of our stuff, but they did distribute catalogs. Which, if you are on Facebook <laughs> or some of the major modeling forums, you've probably seen some of these pictures because they will sort of lit the joint on fire in a very interesting way. Either you are superbly interested in almost everything that I'm about to tell you, or you cannot stand the fact that this company will not make you a streetcar. Understand that they are not going to make you a streetcar. I don't care how much you ask them to. They make race cars. That's what they do. It's like asking Bell Kits to make a factory stock Ford Fiesta, not the World Rally Championship car. Understand that... Uh, there is there are like two modes of operations within the hobby right now. You have the Mobius, Ravel, Salvino kind of American kind of thing. Uh, Ravel, Germany also in this group. Uh, Tommy, I want to say, would be in this group too. Very, very safe. Very conservative. Uh, you know, they're aiming for a customer that has been building models since the 1960s. They expect that experience. They expect that kind of kit. They expect that type of building experience. They're not looking for innovation. They're not looking for new stuff. They just want to feel comfy, cozy in their basements. And then you have the companies like BMAX, New New, Belkitz, uh, Ebro, to a certain extent, although Ebro is so slow, but at least they're doing different stuff. Uh, Heller for like five minutes when the Tommy guy was in charge of it and things like that where they are taking risks. They are taking, you can see this with the Fujimi's uh, recent kits and the way they're designing them. They're in this new phase of operations where they realize they can do something very well. They realize that the consumer, the niche that they're aiming at 
uh, is willing to spend the money because race car builders spend money. I mean, look at how many decal sets I buy. Look at how many photo etch sets I buy. Look at my carbon fiber sets I buy. Look at my race cars I buy. You may say it's excessive and nobody needs that much stuff. And I have not a leg to stand on to argue with you about it. But unless you're talking about the people who build like really, really custom stuff where they're kit bashing several kits together and then they're using, you know, like House of Colors paint and, and customizing, most modelers, especially that casual builder that Ravel likes to go after, and I'd say round two does too, except round two is more looking for the nostalgic casual builder. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not really they're not spending a lot of money. There's a great big there's a great big topic on uh, one of the major forums today of some uh, or not today, but this week of, of a guy who put down Rust-Oleum primer and then painted Duplicolor over top of it and got a disastrous paint reaction because hobby paints are too expensive, hobby kits are too expensive. I'm buying nine dollars. Oh, I'm going to buy a gal or an eight dollar can of paint that's the size of this water bottle and I'm just going to paint everywhere. Thank God that wasn't open because I would have broke my computer up. But <laughs> uh, you know what I mean. It, you know, and I have nothing. Please don't take this as an insult to how you build or anything like that. That's not what it's about. I'm just saying that that's the customer base they're going for. They these guys buy their kids at Hobby Lobby or you know secondhand cheap. The the relentlessly cheap car modelers we've talked about. They may get to the point where they want better stuff. Don't get me wrong. There's not like, a, oh, well, you build you build uh, Ravel kits on the weekend. You'll never get to be as good as me because, I'm, frankly, I'm not that good. Uh, but it is just a spending aspect. You hand me a model kit, and I have to go buy, and it's $35, $40, and I have to go buy a $30 sheet of decals to supplement the livery, and then a $30 sheet of decals to supplement the carbon fiber and then a 25 to 40 dollar detail upset to supplement the photo etch and grills and vents and all that sort of thing and then i go and i buy nine dollar bottles of matte color match paint i'm just putting more money into each model now i'm not saying you have to this is the wow we got off on a tangent here that has nothing to do with the subject matter but i just want to say the the, the point the peg leg pete the general point the thing we're trying to get to here is the fact that bmax and belkett specifically have figured out that there is a market for people who want to do these things, and they are not afraid to crack their wallets open, buy more than one of each of the things, buy the detail upsets that are coming with the things, and then the aftermarket decal companies. Um, we're not seeing a lot of GT3 movement, granted, because it's really only uh, SK and then Racing Decals 43 is making a comeback as far as water slides go. But there's a lot of movement right now in the rally stuff side of things there's probably like nine or ten liveries for the opal manta at this point there's a couple of photo etch sets for it there's a, there's a whole trans kit conversion to make it the very very specific spanish rally versions of the car uh you saw that with like the reissues of all of the hasagala rally cars they keep doing and even hasagala is even on that trip they released all the jtcc cars all of the rally cars all, now they're in their 124 scale open wheels cars they have gotten the idea that race cars are hot right now. I mean, could it become a point like three years when this all blows over and all of these companies are bankrupt because nobody wants to buy their stuff? That depends on the quality of the kits, right? <laughs> if if the quality of the kits are good, people will keep buying them. That's something to keep in mind as we go on <laughs> because that quality of kits thing will come get you someday. <clears throat> so at any rate, off of my soapbox and onto the actual kits here. Uh... I'm going to try to do these in some sort of order because there really is no order to these. Uh, they're pretty much uh, what you would expect in terms of licensing, in terms of what licensing the BMAX already has. So there are several Porsches. There are a number of BMWs. There are a couple of Audis. Yeah, I said a couple, so there's something there you already don't know about. Uh, the Peugeot. The, there's a Nissan. So now we're going to have start having a Nissan livery or Nissan license, which will come in handy, I'm sure, at some point. But that's not really too surprising because we've already talked about the Nissan Sunny little, uh, you know, minor touring car that they were announced. That's not in this pile of stuff I'm about to talk about. There's actually a new Nissan. I would say looking at these, uh, looking at these pictures here, there's one, two, uh, three, four five six there's six uh, brand new announcements in this that have nothing to do with anything we've talked about in the past several things that are not on here are stuff we have talked about in the past please don't panic if they're not going to talk about them because those kits are still in development and, and whatnot uh some the spot model actually uploaded even more pictures than what i have uh of those kits so i know they're still coming 
but like I said, this was pretty much trying to push really some brand new things. There are a couple of kit variations here that you've never heard about. So really there's about eight or nine kits here that you don't know about. But uh, as far as new stuff, uh, you know, eight things. So we're going to do this this way. First, I'm going to talk about this real quick because this will probably be the next reissue after you we get the next M3 and the new kit, uh, the new tool, Mitsubishi Lancer Rally Car. Now, right now, there's no pre-orders per se on either of those as far as Japanese vendors. However, Hobby Easy has both of those kits coming in like March and April. So, uh, oh, I should mention the TSO50 from Tommy. It will be an April release in theory. <laughs> um, you know, we'll see how that works out. So you have this. Uh, the Chevy Cruze 2013 World Touring Car Championship World Champion car. This is going to be a two-in-one decal set. It's both of them are, are Jan, Miller's, uh, Jan Mueller's a car. Um, one represents the Macau Grand Prix before it went back to before it sort of split into two different things. And uh, one being, uh, there's still a World Touring Car uh, race run there. Of course, the GT3 race probably gets a little more attention. Until the Formula 3000 race this year where that poor girl almost uh, died in a terrible crash when she went airborne into the media stand. Um, and the other one here is going to be the Japanese Grand Prix as far as the uh, World Touring Car. Not the, obviously not an F1 race. This is probably going to be a hard pass for me unless there's something specific to this kit that I don't know about. Because these decals themselves were already done by Autocolor, which is... Uh, Max's decal company. We'll talk about that uh, here just recently with the release of the uh, the uh, Hasbengal Rally car, which has auto color fill-in liveries. So both of these decal sets to build either the uh, Macau car or the Japanese Grand Prix car, I believe there are also two other options. In the original decal sheet, one was like China and one was somewhere in Europe, have already been done. So this is basically just re-decaling an existing kit. I don't believe there are any new parts in the 2013 kit that make it any different than the original one that it was like a white, two shade of blue Chevy-sponsored car. Uh, this is just updating it to 2013, but I, I don't think there's anything about the car that changed between 2012 and 2013 that would make you go rush to buy this kit specifically to use your decals on if you already have those. Auto Keller did four livery sets for this car back in 2015 when the car originally was issued. Uh, so, I mean, it's cool that they're putting it back out there again. The Chevy Cruze was something they really, really worked on for a long time. It was one of their first automotive releases. And then it kind of bombed, I think mainly because people got tired of waiting for it. Um, the World Touring Car Championship had sort of died off uh, a little bit in terms of popularity. The Cruze, you know, changed in 2015 to a different body style, and then it sort of you know, TCR rules got involved, and the, the World Touring Car is not really sedans anymore. So, uh, you know, that, like I said, this will probably be like a, I would say like May, June release, probably, if you're interested. Maybe you didn't get one of the original ones, although I think they're still available. Um, but yeah, so that'll be the one, like, one of the first, first of these things that will come back out. Uh, I believe this will probably be like the next thing because it has a reference number, meaning that it already has a stock number and a lot of these things do not and that is this it is going to be a mclaren mp42c for the portugal grand prix in 1986 so there's gonna be two livery sets in this looks like a red marlboro and a yellow marlboro i think it's alan prost and kiki rosberg is who the drivers are here i like the fact that kiki's last name isn't capitalized there's already a detail upset designated with a stock number for it so this is a modified reissue. The MP42 was the original, because you can consider the B2, BT52 Brabham being the second one. This is the original 120 scale F1 car uh, that had a lot of, this is where Aoshima really had a lot of hand in B-Max when it started. Um, so this, I don't know exactly what the difference between a, two, a 2B and a 2C are specifically, because it's but that being as it may, you probably do if you're an F1 fan. Uh, so know that, like I said, there'll be a two-in-one. Um, you're going to both decals in the in the kit. Uh, so you can choose your driver, choose your livery. And, uh, yeah, so that, like I said, that should probably be a summer release, I would expect. Because 
you're going to get some new parts and some new decals. Nothing too wild and crazy there in terms of the uh, you know releases. Now, from there, you look at this stuff and you try to like play prognosticator in terms of like what's going to come next. What do I think is the release order of these kits, right? So I would say that the next thing that you're going to see after that will be this. This is going to be a modified reissue of the Porsche 935. It's going to become a Crummer 3 at this point. We told you that was going to happen from the K2. Uh, this is going to be the 1979 Le Mans winner. Um, this, I say this is coming next because you notice this is not a picture of a car. It is a picture of a built test shot. Uh, the rear wing on this is really different from the original K2. But So this will be probably the maybe one of the other next reissues um, because there's some different pieces and parts here. You know, you, know you, could, you knew other kits were coming with the fact that like the sides of the rear fenders were separate and things like that. Um, but it'd be cool to have a Le Mans winner. You know, have to go out and buy new decal sheets. Uh, for that. I know a lot of people play build Le Mans cars specifically, but um, I do like the fact that they spell Le Mans all as one word, which is what I tend to do when I type it into a search engine. So I appreciate the spirit animalness of that. I would say that the next, one of the next new tools that's going to be released will be this because we've already seen a prototype that looks like it's more plastic than, you know, clay. And that is this, the, uh, BMW E46 S Super 2000 uh, DTCC car, um, only like I said because we've seen at the most recent Japan model show that there's a plastic prototype of this. So that means this is further in development than some of the 3D prototype th images that we've seen in the past. So uh, that'll be a fun kit. We've already talked about it in the past. Um, some other things that are uh, sort of clay, if you will, some of the things we've seen prototypes of. Are this the Porsche 911 Group B rally car with the Rothmans livery? Very, very interesting to see if they actually include the Rothmans actual livery in that. Uh, if not, I'm sure they'll be in a detail upset near you. This is a prototype we've seen before. It'll be interesting to see if this comes in plastic uh, in terms of a prototype at Shizuka or not. Um, this would be one of the things that's you know in development uh, more than anything else. A lot of people complain about the fact that that. Uh, they don't think the rocker panels are the same on this, and it may not be. I don't know. I just don't can't figure it out. Some people seem to think that they're they're trying to make a Group 4 race car, not a rally car out of it. So that would be the difference there. The other thing we've seen a prototype of would be this. It is the Peugeot 306 Maxi uh, rally car. This, of course, would be uh, a 1990s era rally car. We've seen, like I said, the rapid prototyping of this, so it should be further along in development by now. Perhaps a 2000, a legitimate 2019 release. Uh, another modified reissue that probably will come out this year will be this. Uh, the Porsche 935 K3 uh, 1979 Le Mans Paul Newman car. Uh, this is the Dick Barber racing car that Paul Newman ran uh, along with a couple other drivers in the 1979 Le Mans. I think it finished second in this car. Uh, so it's a different front bumper and a different rear spoiler. Uh, I think this is actually like a K2, K3, 935-77. There's a weird thing going on with this car. There's There were only so many Kremers ever built, and some of them were rebodied, and some of them were not, and uh, some chassis, of course, were destroyed and racing and replaced. Um, I think this is really a 1978 K2 that ran like the IMSA series that they then took to Le Mans and modified as a K3 car. I don't think this is, because Dick Barber Racing did get a K3 car, but I don't think this is technically the one. There's a, You really have to start diving into the history of the Porsches to understand uh, some of the goofiness that went on with, you know, because you're ordering cars from the factory, basically. And it was delayed, it didn't get delivered, and oh, hey, now we got to run this other thing. So, uh, like I said, another modified reissue from the K from the 935. They're not going to pile them out too fast, I don't think. I don't think they want to kill the market with releasing five of the same thing, uh, you know, just observing the general market. You can see how well that works sometimes. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, a thing that's coming as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, there's there's going to be a new kit series. They're calling Easy Kit. I don't know what's so easy about these kits exactly. They didn't specify. But there are three brand new kit announcements for this Easy Kit series. I don't know if they're going to be snap tight, if they're going to be what... 
Uh, the marketing material says water slide decal, so they're not going to be completely and totally uh, like cheaped out. But first up, you have this. It is a 124 scale Mazda Nissan 280Z. Uh, this, of course, would be uh, uh, Paul, or not Paul Newman, but uh, actually it is. I think it is Paul Newman's uh, SCCA car. So very interesting to see them go in this direction. You know, this American race series. Granted, it is an Asian car, a uh, very, very, very famous driver, uh, and just person in general, let alone race car driver. But, yeah, so that's kind of interesting to see. It'd be interesting to see what, this, what these easy kits are going to be about. Uh, then in the next thing in the easy kit line is going to be this, which is a 124 scale BMW 320 Group 5 car. Now this is something I have been wanting and desiring for a really long time. Now Tommy had did a Group 5 320, but it's in 120th scale. And there are a couple of really old 1970s motorized Japanese kits that are something resembling 124 scale in terms of a Group 5 BMW 320. But none of them are actually, you know, a real live good kit. So I'm very, like I said, this is probably the thing where my my easy, what's an easy kit model mean? Really, the interest peaks for me because this car, in its format of being a Group Five car, uh, is the car that ran alongside the Porsche 935 in Macau. Now you got to remember, there's a little bit of a Macau background to everything they're gonna do. Uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, I think it was 1978 through 1982, or 1981, excuse me, there were four Macau Grand Prix run in Group 5 formatting. The Porsche 935 won two, and the 320i won the other two. So it's very cool to have those, uh, you know, available, so maybe we can get some liveries made for them specifically for that. Uh, and that'll block out a nice chunk of that. Actually, a very interesting fact that we figured out from looking at this. With this kit, another kit I'm going to talk to you about in a second, along with things that already exist, you will be able to build every single winning car for the Macau Grand Prix from 1979 until 2004. Every one of them. Some second place and third place cars too, but every single winning car will be a uh, base kit will be available. Decals not yet, but base kits, base kits available. Every car for Macau for you know two and a half decades. Very cool. Um, you'll be able to build some of the World Touring Car Championship car from 2012 to 2013, uh, and then with way that Frankie's got the SK decals, I believe you can uh, build several of the years winning cards, at least from 2015 to now, uh, as far as the, uh, you know, the Fiat GT thing. So that's coming out. And then there's one more easy kit, which is this. It is a BMW M1 Group 5 car. I've already seen a couple of people, well, what you know the M1 for? Yeah, the SC and Larry Protar. Okay, well, that's a Group 4 race car, not a Group 5 race car. There's a difference there. Uh, may not be something that registers in your closed mind, but for the rest of us who can have two pair of working eyes and know that Group Five was a thing, uh, yeah. How about a Group? How about a Group Five M1? Um, some very cool racing liveries just on these uh, two cars. Um, the BASF car in general looks like a decaling nightmare. Uh, so I really, I'm very, very interested to see what these are when they come to fruition. Are they going to be? Uh, an easy kit the way the Fujimis are, where they're very, very multi-piece uh, modular kits uh, that allow for future product development. Uh, are they going to be like build and play snap tag kits? Like, we're, what, what about them is easy? Because BMAX kits aren't hard to begin with, right? They're not, they're not overly complicated. They're not really like out there in terms of build quality, parts content, uh, just you know, being difficult to assemble. So I'm not really sure what's going to be easy about these. I'm very, very intrigued about what the easy kit line is going to actually mean in reality. Somebody's banging a trailer around the back of the truck stuff here. So let's talk about some of the other kits that are going to be released that we've already talked, we've already seen like mentions of when that whole dump of information came out and then got pulled back. So there's this. It is the BMW E90 World Touring Car Championship. Uh, so there's gonna be two livery sets in this, so that'll be interesting to see what those two livery sets are. Um, they, this car may be somewhere in 
you know, development a little further along than I think it is. If you're already saying there's going to be two decals for it, you probably have an idea at least what those two decal sheets are going to be. Uh, then you have this, which is one of the other E46 cars, the M3 GTR uh, kit. So we already knew that was coming out. That was in the data dump. A new announcement uh, that came out this in this show was this, the Audi A4 uh, 1996 British Touring Championship car. Uh, this is very, very interesting. A lot of people uh, sort of shrugged at this one. Well, there's a resin kit of that. Okay, A, it's expensive. B, it's resin. And C, a little known fact to a lot of people uh, is that during the most recent spate of California wildfires this year, uh, mercifully the family and proprietor are okay, but the guy who was casting these for m and uh, he lost everything in that fire. Like, the masters are gone, the molds are gone. It, it's very, very doubtful that you would ever see this kit, uh, a supply of this kit come back. Like, if you don't buy one of these now, uh, good chances you won't ever get one. Um, I expect this will probably get a D1, uh, the D1, the, uh, the German touring series that ran in 1996. It's not DTM, it's something else that's just off my mind, top of my mind. Um... And then this car also won two races in the 1990s in Macau. So expect some liveries for that as well. This is another like key plug-in for the Macau uh, connection that BMAX has. Um, let me see. Is there anything else? Because uh, we have more to talk about. I'm trying to make sure I've got everything in this part done. And I believe I do. All right. So the other thing that BMAX owns, of course, is new, new hobby. Uh, people will insist that that's not true. Uh, uh, you argue, fight, rant, rave, act a fool, uh, whatever, it means your life, not mine. Uh, but they clearly do because they're in the same catalog. So, one of the things we've already known about, or two of the things we already know about, we know that they're doing a modern 911, and we know they're doing the Audi R8. What came out of this is the fact that they're actually doing two modern 911s. The Porsches, the Audi is probably going to come out first. From what I understand, from talking to some people who know some people over there, the Audi is further along in development and may come out in early summer if, if all the things go the way they plan to. The 911 is a little bit delayed because, probably first of all, Porsche, but second of all, uh, they decided to change development midstream when they realized they really couldn't get everything they wanted off of one model, and they needed to split it into two. So, obviously, we know about the Audi R8, the LMS. Now, the problem with this a little bit, in my mind, is the fact that the Audi RS or R8 is going to do into its Evo spec this year, which has a wildly different and, frankly, very ugly front end on it. So, hopefully, when they started making this kit, uh, they have figured out a way to bake an Evo version into this, uh, even if it means they have to release a whole new body tool to it. Because this 2018, uh, you know, I, I want to say what, 2015, 2018, somewhere in there is where the scar runs as far as its lifespan of this specific configuration, because the 2012, 2013 cars are a little different front ends. Um, you know, it sort of has a dead stop where... Uh, Last, the end of this racing year in 2018 was when these cars stopped. In 2019, they've been running the new uh, front-end cars, on even at 24 hours in Daytona. Um, it's unfortunate, but that is what racing is when you're trying to make modern cars. You're never going to be able to really stay on top of current cars. You're always going to sort of be making a couple seasons back. The other announcements uh, from them, and I've got my... For some reason, they don't want to... <laughs> display in the order that I'm showing them in when I left right mouse like that, is this the Porsche 911 GT3 RSR. Now, everybody who looked at one, you can't do both of those things. It can't be a GT3 car and an RSR. There, there One's a GT Le Mans class car and the other one's a GT3 car. And somewhere along the lines, they figured that out. So they split the kits. You're going to have an RSR car, and this right here looks like it's in both the uh, Ping Ping 24 Hours of Le Mans livery and it's a uh, regular WEC livery. Uh, I expect to... Oh, well, actually, no, I should take it back. That's the Rothmans livery uh, from the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Uh, there is a regular WEC livery that they ran the rest of the year. 
And then they're, they're hopefully somebody will do the Petit Le Mans uh, race livery from here in the United States, that WEC race, because those cars were also very, very different. So very cool that we're going to get that. And then, of course, the, the side effect of that is now there is this, the Porsche 911 GT3R, the actual appropriate GT3 car, because, of course, the whole front end is different on the GT3 car in terms of, like, the hood slats and all that stuff. Uh, very interesting. They're showing the Manthe cars from uh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Be interested to see if they do that. Uh, they got a little bit of a 20, 24 Hours of Le Mans. 24 Hours of Nuremberg uh, they've got a little bit of connection with that now. Obviously, the Falcon car came out with uh, 24 hours of, of Nuremberg racing livery in it. So, uh, very cool that they're doing the right thing, in my mind, of splitting the two things up so that you can build both things. It was going to be just an issue if they tried to be like, oh, yeah, it's a GT3 car, too. Just pay no attention to the fact that it looks nothing like a GT3 car. So there's that. And then they have one last thing, one announcement they made of the show coming in 2020, because I don't get started this, and apparently they're going to follow along with it. BMW M8 GTE class car. So uh, this would be a GTL, GTL Le Mans class car, really, technically speaking. Uh, but this is in its 24 hours of uh, Daytona livery. I don't know if this is this year's livery or last year's, but be that as it may, one of the things that I really appreciated about this year's 24 hours of Daytona was the fact that Alex Zanardi was back in a BMW. Uh, several liveries were made, mostly by Racing Decals 43. Uh, I think Studio 27 did one too of his Z4 that he ran for Team Roll, which is an Italian uh, car, in Blanc paint. Uh, those were cool liveries and the Z4, yeah. but he went into like DTM after that. And of course, Ravel, for whatever reason, decided they weren't going to play in the DTM pool anymore because apparently the DTM kits were too good and they decided now nah, we'd rather make crappy Panameras rather than good kits anymore. And uh, be that as it may, I really would like to have built Alex Zanardi's car from this year's car. It's very, the guy's a very inspiring guy. He ain't got no legs and he's still driving a race car. So he's got better spirits than 98% of the car modelers I come by. So, it'll be a little bit of a wait until 2020, but I am two thumbs up to uh, BMAX for that. Now, it's kind of an interesting choice, mainly because it's a very singular-purposed car. I mean, you could do a 24 Hours of Daytona release, and then you could do a 24 Hours of Le Mans release, and some, you know... But Schnitzer Motorsports is Schnitzer Motorsports, and their livery is pretty much the same throughout, and, you know, I don't... I don't see a whole bunch of movement in this. It's not like the 935 where you can release a base 935 and a K2 and a K3 and a K4 and a K5. And, you know, down the road you go with all the various modified releases. This is kind of a one-shot and done tooling, but so is the Cruise. Uh, but that is the other thing I was very, 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 very happy to see. Again, mainly because I really appreciate Alex Zanardi's uh, life story. Uh, especially after, you know, he left open with that crazy, nonsensical open wheel stuff that I don't build. So, uh, yeah, that guy's wrapped it up. Wow, 3.1 gigabyte records. This is going to be a long video, I'm sure. Uh, maybe i go back in and edit out the rant. But, of course, not if I just said that. I have to edit out the part I was going to edit out the rant, or else you'd be like, what rant? What did he take out? That, guy's was not what we were expecting. We were expecting a 10-minute show. These are the three kit releases. Look, new decals from Nobby from uh, SK decals. Woohoo! And off we went. But, nope. B-Max showed up and went, uh, excuse me, we have things to discuss. So, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found something in there that's going to trip your interest over the course of probably the next two years because all of that stuff's not coming out in 2019. There's just no way. Uh, but uh, now you know what to uh, sit around and lust after. <laughs> See you guys on the other side.